While you're headed back to your seats, we get into the substantive I'll just uh, remarks. I'll just um, highlight a couple of points. Uh, one of the things that uh, Schmender asked me to point out is that uh, he, he currently has he has this massive charter, and um, he has anyone want to guess how many people actually work in ISE? Less than or greater than 50. Less than or greater than 20. Less than or greater than 10. Less. Nine people, and they're hiring. So, um, uh, <laughs> so if you need, to, if you're looking for a government job or a contracting job or whatever, Schmender said, um, only qualified applicants, please. But um, so that uh, leaves me out. But um, uh, please, uh, please contact the ISE folks. Second, we also, <laughs> the great irony of life, um, learned that um, the streaming, the live streaming of this on the CSIS website and the uh, PMI ISE website is not accessible by the intelligence community. Um, so <laughs> so we, w we would encourage all of you from the intelligence community to use your home computers to download the podcast later and uh, look at it in that format. Um, and then and lastly, I just want to point out one individual, a couple individuals we have here. Um, They'll probably hate me for doing this, but some folks have been very working this information sharing for a long, long time, and one of them has been very, very instrumental and um, has actually been working, you know, overtime since 1225. Is uh, uh, Mike Resnick and Monty Hawkins over here from the National Security Staff, um, and um, they're, they're not they're not speaking, but it's it's important that they're here and rec recognize that the efforts they've done at their level to to bring this dialogue to where it is today. The fact that we have this many people in a room and this in this kind of a star-studded panel here to talk about this issue. So thank you both for your, your efforts. Um, uh, this, this is a phenomenal panel. Um, it really is. Uh, some of these individuals have been here before at CSIS. Uh, they're each uh, keynote panelists uh, speakers in and of themselves, and, and the fact that we have four of them together is uh, is just is just quite a quite a testament to their commitment to this issue, and um, we're we're very fortunate to have them here. Um, we kind of organize this international to domestic. That was my logic, and if it doesn't make sense, I'm sorry. That was the only thing I could come up with. But um, uh, there, everyone, you should have received a packet, and it has everyone's detailed bio in there. But what I'm going to do is just uh, give a brief introduction to each individual, and then we'll start off with, uh, with Russ's remarks. Which uh, First up will be Russ Travers. He's the Deputy Director for Information Sharing and Knowledge Development at the National Counterterrorism Center, and he manages NCTC's Terrorism Information Sharing Initiatives and has been there since the beginning. Um, to the right of him is uh, Kira Amin. He's the Chief Information Officer in the Bureau of Consular Affairs and Director for the Office of Consular Systems and Technology at State Department. In this capacity, uh, Kira manages all of Consular Affairs Information Technology Systems. No small task. Uh, next up is uh, uh, Gil Kierlikowski, Director of the Office of National Drug Control Policy. Um, and obviously we all know what the, the drug czar does, and we're, we're very honored to have Gil back again here. And then also for a repeat performance um, we had with the Secretary a couple months back is uh, Bart Johnson. He's Principal Deputy Undersecretary for Intelligence and Analysis at the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, Mr. Johnson serves as a second-ranking official in the office and provides Secretary Napolitano and her staff and I love this one, along with state, local, tribal, and private sector partners with timely information on terrorism threats. And again, that's what's so key about this is that state and local and that private sector. But uh, without further ado, we'll do the, each of them five to seven minutes, and then we'll do questions and answers again. So, Russ, if you'd like to kick it off, that'd be great. Thanks very much, Ozzy. It's a, a pleasure to be here with my colleagues to talk about what is a very important and I think extremely complicated question. Uh, if you ask 10 different people what the information sharing environment is, I think you're likely to get 10 different opinions. Uh, as, as Shamandra's talk and questions suggested, some people like to talk about pipes, some like to talk about business process, some like to talk about culture, some want to talk about all three. I think for the purposes of, of my talk this morning, I, I'm going to try to be a little bit more concrete and, and focus on NCTC's role specifically and address uh, what I believe to be the current state of information sharing across the community. I think it's an important question because uh, if we go back to the attempted bombing of, of Northwest Flight 253 on Christmas Day, uh, there was a, a good bit of discussion afterwards about information sharing. and I think, frankly, some of it was pretty muddled. There, there was some suggestion that perhaps information sharing was worse now than it was before 9-11, and I flat out disagree with that. Uh, what I'm going to do is give you a kind of a practitioner's perspective. 
I'm going to give you three facts, or at least what I believe to be facts, and then I'm going to try to address two follow-on questions that I think flow from those facts. So fact number one, 1225 was not a 9-11-like information sharing problem at all. There were two key pieces of information uh, regarding Umar Farouk Abdelmutallab, and those two pieces of information sharing, those two pieces of information were broadly shared across the entire counterterrorism community. They both could have been found with a properly constructed Google-like search, but they weren't because the community didn't address either one of those particular dots. They didn't find them important in the overall mass of information. That's a big problem, but it's not an information sharing problem. Fact number two, by any objective standard, there is more information being shared with more people in a timely manner than at any point in our history. And that's just, a, that, that is an unassailable fact. If you look at every major plot that's been disrupted over the last six, seven, eight years, effective information sharing played a critical role. In some cases, it was federal to federal. In some cases, it was federal to non-federal. And in some cases, it would have been U.S. government to allied. We are getting pretty good at this. Fact number three, despite relatively positive trends, there is still clearly work to be done. And you're going to hear from my colleagues, I'm sure, on a number of the different aspects of what we need to improve on. And there will always be room for improvement. I would say, however, that I think as a result of the good work that has been done over the last seven, eight years across the United States government and with our non-federal partners, the low-hanging fruit is largely gone. And what I think we have are some very difficult issues to address. So what I want to do is build on those three facts and attempt to address two follow-on questions. First, why is this so hard? You will often hear, why can't we just give analysts all information? Why is that a problem? And I think actually the answer to that question is really pretty easy. Is there anyone in this room that would advocate complete unfettered sharing of U.S. person's information? Kind of doubt it. Secondly, do we believe that we should abide by the law? question came up earlier, FISA court restrictions on information, or Privacy Act, or Bank Secrecy Act, or Systems of Record Notice. There are many legitimate legal restrictions on information flow, and that will always be the case. Thirdly, our foreign partners, our critical foreign partners, give us information. They may well put restrictions on how that information is shared within the United States government. If we want their information, we abide by the restrictions. And lastly, as was suggested by the discovery question to Shamandra's talk, what if information sharing would prejudice judicial proceedings? Or what if information sharing would prejudice ongoing operations? You may have a good cause to share some of that information with some people, but there are going to be distinct limitations on how broadly it goes. So it seems to me self-evident that that there are always going to be legitimate impediments on the sharing of information. So if that's the case, that takes me to the second question. How do we best proceed in the implementation of the ISE given those constraints? And I think it's pretty safe to say that the answer isn't to simply flood the system with more information. And I think, frankly, we've got a little bit of the cart before the horse. I believe that we need to focus first on mission, roles and responsibilities, who does what should guide who gets what. In general, I think that means that we need to focus on a, a more sophisticated uh, definition of what analysis is that covers a range of, of responsibilities within the government. Not all analysis is the same. For instance, it would seem to me that those who are charged with finding non-obvious relationships between and amongst data sets need the very broadest form of of access to promote what was discussed earlier, discovery. On the other hand, some analysts are responsible for largely a situational awareness function. They don't need raw data. And what they need is the all source finished judgments so that they can then inform their own risk equation and decide what actions need to be taken. In general, it seems to me, if you start delineating between and among the different kinds of analysis, you begin to come up with a reason basis for who should get what information. 
And in closing, I think what I'll do is take a, a page from Shamandra's playbook and pose a, a, a few additional questions that I think we all need to address. Given the nature of the threat, how do we think about privacy when the foreign and domestic divide doesn't mean very much anymore? Extraordinarily difficult question. Secondly, what do we mean by domestic intelligence and how do we share it? It's going to be the subject for a major conference tomorrow, as I think you probably know. And thirdly, my own personal bugaboo, how do we go about discovery and finding those non-obvious relationships when you do have, in fact, a sea of data? And that was the 1225 problem. It seems to me that those are the kinds of questions that are going to bedevil all of us as we go about looking for our shared goal of an improved information sharing environment. Thanks very much. Thanks, Russ. We appreciate that. Uh, Kirit, over to you. Good morning. Uh, I don't know how many of you understand the mission of the Bureau of Consular Affairs within the State Department. It's a very unique bureau within the State Department, which is really foreign affairs and uh, diplomatic relations. What we do in the Bureau of Consular Affairs is a threefold mission, which I really break it down into two. We provide non-citizen services and citizen services. Under the non-citizen services, we are empowered to issue visas all over the world. Okay. And under the citizen services, we have a two-fold mission. One is we issue passports domestically. Second is, and which is really an awesome responsibility, is serving the Americans overseas. And that normally plays the gamut. We never know what's coming at us on a given day as far as whatever happens overseas. From a minor mugging happens in a city somewhere and they've lost all documents and they show up at the embassy or a consulate saying, I'm an American. Okay. to a disaster like Haiti or Mumbai two years ago. Okay. And we come into action, Lebanon, evacuation. That's our responsibility. Having said that, that's an awesome responsibility. From the issue of issuing what we call the travel documents, whether it be passports or it be visas, we are the first line of defense when it comes to border security. If we screw up, they are legally coming in, okay? Uh, which to us is, is, is really daunting every single day when we are issuing close to two million travel documents a month between the passports and the visas, okay? Every single day, our officers all over the world, 270 locations worldwide, uh, internationally and 30 domestic. Okay? That's close to 300 locations worldwide that we serve on a given day. We are a 24-7, 365 operation. Today, we use biometrics, the multimodality of it. We cannot issue a single visa today without the 10 prints coming to IDENT and IAFIS and back. Same thing with facial recognition. We are piloting right now IRIS out of Baghdad for special immigrant visas. In collaboration, again, talk about information sharing with the Department of Defense. We cannot do our jobs if it wasn't for information sharing. Both ways. We share information and we need information from other agencies. Today, if I talk about our databases, some of the largest in the federal government, our consular consolidated database today is over 100 terabytes, okay, with growing at the rate of five to six terabytes a month, okay? To keep ahead of that is, is also challenging. Today, from an information sharing standpoint, we have 11,000 plus State Department users, however, we also have close to 20,000 non-state department users, mostly DHS and Intel, okay? One might say you have users, so what? What if I told you that we get 120 million hits on the database a month, 
Okay. Having said that, it's an awesome task, and we are as good as the information we have in terms of our officers who have to process. You go to a place like Shanghai today or Mumbai when they are processing 15 and 1,600 people a day, <coughs> interviewing and processing them. Okay? It's a very, very challenging and difficult task. And to us, information sharing is, is, is the ultimate way we can do this. We have built our systems today to be able to share the information easily to those 20 plus thousand non-state department users. And the way we have done this is we have built a very person-centric system where we can have a book on any person that we know about, whether it's a citizen or a non-citizen. And as Raj says, what are the difficulties, right? You talk about privacy information for Americans with the passport data. You all know what happened two and a half years ago when the presidential candidate passport information was. That's from within. How do we protect that, right? So there's a legal and uh, policy issues that we face every single day. The other difficulty we face is every time we go and say we need some data to be shared, we are told, yeah, but you are not law enforcement. Technically, that is correct. We are not a law enforcement agency, right? We are trying to now work with the Hill to designate us as law enforcement only from data sharing standpoint. We're not going to go arm our <laughs> officers overseas. It's not just going to happen. So these, these, again, are the legal and other aspects of that. The other thing we have done is we have built our infrastructure today, which is basically so our architecture that is NIEM compliant. Why? Again, to make it easier and follow the OMB standards to be able to share data easier, faster, uh, to protect, really, our borders. We are the first line of defense. That's all I have. Gil, thanks, Kurt. Thanks. Thanks, and good morning to everyone. Um, I was intrigued, and I'll veer off course for just a minute by uh, both the questions uh, to Shamandra, but also uh, when Russ brought up the issues around uh, privacy and civil liberties, because I, I don't think it gets uh, talked about or focused on enough at times. And having come from the local level for a, a long, really long career, uh, uh, I think it's important. I served on the National Academies panel for about a year and a half, and I'd refer you to the book that came out last year from them on data mining and privacy. Uh, I think that was uh, an incredibly powerful piece that Secretary Perry and uh, the President uh, Emeritus of MIT, Chuck Vest, chaired. And I think it's, uh, it's very helpful. I came away, by the way, with the conclusion that uh, citizens had really nothing to fear from government, but uh, that the private sector was so much more sophisticated based on your Safeway card or your visa transactions, et cetera, about information. The other part that I think that uh, has been lost uh, but is now reemerging is that uh, right after 9-11, uh, everything was Fed-centric all the time. It was all Fed all the time. And I think that there was an incredible amount, and I imagine Bart can share some of this also, an incredible amount of expertise, experience, knowledge, et cetera, et cetera, at the state and local level that uh, unfortunately I think was overlooked, uh, not out of bad reasons, uh, but out of reasons of people just overly uh, pushing the issue of, of what is this country going to do to protect itself in the future. And I really feel that, uh, particularly in the last couple years, uh, that we're looking back at, at an area of expertise and an area of uh, sophistication at the state and local level that can be actually quite helpful. The other part that uh, uh, has been done at the state and local level with a lot of, uh, I, I think, success is balancing the privacy and civil liberties area. Uh, in the, the Handshoe Agreement in New York, uh, even though changes were made, the Intelligence Ordinance uh, oversight and audit of the intelligence function in the Seattle Police Department, where I served for nine years uh, as chief, uh, we were able to certainly work 
within those existing laws and still feel comfortable in gathering information, sharing information, and actually protecting the people of, uh, of, of Seattle. The other part that I want to stress now because of the new role that I have, or it's not so new, about a year and a half, is that ONDCP, we have the HIDAs. The HIDAs are the high intensity drug trafficking areas and they have been around for a long time. And I truly believe they are an incredible and, and, and very successful model for information sharing at the federal, state, and local level. Information sharing that has gone on for quite a while, that is uh, some of the most sensitive uh, information, uh, truly life-threatening information with ongoing narcotics cases, major cases, conspiracies, etc. Uh, that if the information uh, uh, was uh, inappropriately uh, released or, or not properly used, uh, it could not uh, just result or would not just result probably in the loss of the case or the loss of the load, but it could result in the loss of an undercover uh, uh, officer or detective uh, or trooper's life. And, uh, and these have been around sharing the most sensitive information in a really timely, uh, in, in a really timely way. The 28 regional HIDAs uh, uh, are in 15% uh, of all the counties in the United States. They cover 58% of the United States population. They are in 45 states, Puerto Rico, the U.S. Virgin Islands, and the District of Columbia. And they have an intelligence and investigative support center. So it results not only in information sharing, in, uh, but also analysis. Uh, they have a long history of working with the National Guard and others. Um, as you can tell, the focus has been uh, up until the last few years in particular, but the focus has been on drug trafficking organizations. Now I would tell you that particularly at the, at the state and local level, the issue is about all crimes and an all crimes approach. Uh, the other part is, uh, is not just the um, issues that, uh, that uh, are, are brought forward as far as the cost of the development and the architecture. Uh, the computers, the hardware and the software and on and on. I think everyone who manages a budget knows where the real money uh, always comes from and always goes to and that's in your personnel costs. And so when you look at these organizations, uh, after you've purchased this equipment and after you've leased these buildings, uh, uh, et, et cetera, the real cost is in the bodies. Who is going to staff them? Who are going to be the analysts? Who are going to follow up on the leads and on and on? Oftentimes, again, that comes uh, from the state and local level. That's why the focus has been on an all crimes approach. The other smart part about the, I think, the changes that have been made and, and using HIDAS is what I would think would be a good template of information sharing uh, that has occurred for a very long time is that uh, uh, trying to have artificial distinctions between or among transnational organized crime groups counterterrorism uh, issues and drug trafficking organizations. Uh, it becomes very murky and as you try to uh, put these into silos, you find that, the si that they don't fit into silos uh, very easily. And so looking at the all crimes approach, whether it was uh, cigarette smuggling in, uh, in Charlotte, North Carolina that uh, was funding Hamas, whether it was uh, a case of health care fraud in St. Louis that was funding another uh, or partially funding uh, another uh, terrorist organization. Uh, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense to try and have these things in, in, different, uh, in different venues. It makes an awful lot of sense to consider them uh, in, in other ways. Um, I think that uh, working closely with, uh, with federal agencies and now ha uh, being a Fed for the, for the last year and a half, uh, and having a number of people that have been brought into this administration from uh, with a lot of experience at the state and local level has meshed very well to help move us forward in a way that makes a lot of sense. Not only from the technical difficulties, uh, but also the importance of privacy, the importance of civil liberties, but also the importance of relationships. And it really
really is, after all is said and done, it really is about relationships and it is about co-location uh, of uh, among uh, the question that was asked uh, to Shamandra about culture and trust and uh, and there is nothing that uh, uh, that breeds the improvement of uh, culture and trust than the, than the co-location of these uh, uh, individuals. So I've been uh, I couldn't agree more with uh, also what Russ has said in my career to see the amount of information that is shared, but uh, we have to be careful about uh, the information overload issue also. Thank you, Gil. Uh, Mark. Good morning, everybody. Ozzy, thank you for this opportunity and, and this conversation that we're having uh, today, you know, couldn't be more relevant and more timely uh, considering the threat environment that we're living in, the travel advisory that just went out over the weekend, so thank you for that. Um, and not only that, you know, in my position, you know, with, as a principal deputy within uh, the Office of Intelligence Analysis, I, I really believe that we have a, um, you know, a true role and responsibility uh, to work with the state, local, and tribal components, and certainly the intelligence community, to advocate for the information and get that information into the hands of the people uh, that really uh, need it need it the most. I think it should be, you know, pretty clear, you know, to everybody that we are doing that in very much in partnership uh, with those entities, you know, to include uh, the FBI, you know, ONDCP, uh, DOD, and NCTC, and many others. Um, it was interesting to hear, you know, Shemender talk about the national strategy. I reminisced a little bit as he was talking, and, and I was in the room, you know, when that uh, was released in the White House uh, back in October of 2007. And a lot of time and effort and hard work, you know, went into that by many of you uh, in this room. Um, and also the Criminal Intelligence Coordinating Council that Shemender spoke about before, uh, that they've really been pushing and leading a lot of these initiatives that have led, you know, the federal government, you know, to rally around that effort. And that's something, you know, that we certainly uh, need to continue. Uh, in fact, uh, the Global Advisory Committee uh, also, you know, did NEEM, the National Information Exchange Model. I see Donna Roy here, and a lot of the things uh, that are currently uh, underway. So as we build that refresh, um, I'm sure, you know, I'm confident, you know, you know, uh, Shemender, you've already spoken to uh, uh, Ron Brooks, you know, the chair of the CICC. Uh, you were at that meeting the other day, and, it, and it's good to see uh, that that, you know, uh, integration is continuing. I think it should be also recognizable that the Secretary has been very forward-leaning as it relates to uh, information sharing. In fact, she spoke about it, you know, within one week of her uh, taking office. And she's been pushing uh, very uh, focused uh, every step of the way. Uh, she's bringing, you know, the department to the next level of maturity as it relates to uh, one DHS. And when you bring the assets of the components together, uh, it is very formidable, um, you know, whether it's at the NCTC or in the field. You know, Kurt spoke about, you know, that line of defense. Uh, they're also the line of defense as trying to identify, interdict uh, the knowns and also try to identify the unknowns that may be operating uh, within the country. So we've done a lot and we need to do, you know, much more and we're certainly going to work, you know, with all of you to do that. I just really want to touch upon, you know, the threat just, you know, very briefly. Uh, I've been with the department. Uh, for about 16 months now. Uh, it's been extremely busy. Uh, I got there on uh, May, May 16th, and this activity uh, started May 18th of 2009. Had two successful attacks here domestically with Nadal uh, Hassan and, and Carlos Bledsoe. We had two uh, near misses, Abdul Matalib, uh, Faisal Shazad, and a number of other, you know, uh, incidents that have occurred over the past 16 months which really show and illustrate that we need to operate under the premise that they're here within our borders and they could attack uh, with little or no warning. So really what does that mean? It means that we can't always rely on the fine work of the intelligence community, that we really need to, you know, focus on the components, uh, the FBI and the first responders in the form of state, local, tribal, deputies, you know, sheriffs, you know, uh, troopers in the field and really give them the information that they need uh, to, their, to, to do their job. And like uh, Director Kurlikowski, I spent 32 years in law enforcement and they are interacting with the public every day, uh, vehicle and traffic stops, uh, lawful intercepts, sources, uh, indicators and warnings, and they have the best opportunity to possibly identify something, you know, that could be uh, amiss. So the JTTFs do a wonderful job um, as it relates to investigating something along, but what about the unknowns and who's going to be in the best position to identify the storing, the acquiring, the mixing, the traveling, the interaction with others, co-conspirators, to possibly carry out a terrorist attack, you know, within, within the country. 
So what we're striving to do with our partners um, is to certainly get a better understanding of the threat of the environment, you know, assess it, analyze it, contextualize it, and share it with our partners in the field so they can be better informed uh, to do and protect and support uh, the homeland. So getting back to the national strategy for information sharing, um, I've read it numerous times. I have it all bookmarked, and it resonates with me uh, now uh, just as it did, you know, back in 2007. But having said that, you know, we have matured, we have grown, and there are other, other things that we need to address and look at as we move out. But it is a very strong foundational uh, uh, document, especially as it relates to, you know, the home and security information could come from a number of sources, and it needs to be integrated and analyzed and shared with the appropriate individuals, um, you know, that we need to uh, share. So what are we doing about it, you know, with it, within the department, uh, in partnership uh, with the FBI, the NCTC, and our other federal uh, counterparts to include, you know, the CICC also? Uh, we've established a DH threats, DHS threat task force uh, that brings to bear the assets of the components and all the information sharings that they hold to really support the FBI and the NCTC in the pursuit of these individuals. Um, as it relates to the National Network of Fusion Centers, of which there's 72 now, um, it's evolving, it's maturing. Uh, we're certainly deploying more personnel uh, to the field. We're providing them unclassified uh, connectivity, secret con connectivity, and secret is very important because that allows, you know, further contextualization of the information that they're looking at in an unclassified uh, world, and they are trusted, federally cleared individuals within our state and local uh, tribal environments that actually know how to handle the information and how to treat it. Another thing we're doing, and Shemeta made reference to this and working with Mike Resnick, is also the baseline capabilities in partnership with FBI. So when you look at the baseline capabilities that came out in the fall of 2008, we've already completed a short two years later an overview and assessment as to where those gaps are and identifying the gaps, fill it, filling the gaps, and really laying against, you know, the ability to receive, analyze, disseminate, and the return flow uh, for the suspic suspicious activity uh, reporting. Uh, working with the FBI, we provided, you know, threat briefs to the field. We have new products, uh, new product lines. I believe we're doing a much, uh, you know, better uh, job in, you know, getting that information out. The Secretary has been very forward-leaning, working with Tom O'Reilly, good friend from New Jersey, um, about see something, say something, and the need to not only inform, you know, our law enforcement and home security partners, but also the public. And once again, you only have to look at the vendor, you know, on May 1st in Times Square who actually saw something and said something about a smoking vehicle that, you know, could have contributed to the mitigation, you know, the impact of that, you know, attempted attack. Uh, we're working very closely with private sector. I see Bridger McGraw and also uh, Linda Millis here in the room as it relates to inter interacting with private sector, getting them the information. They own the majority of the private, you know, sector out there. And how do we better share with them and really, uh, you know, what uh, do we need to do? So where do we go from here? I think we need to, you know, build that trust and collaboration that everybody has spoken about. Um, I believe everybody does, you know, want to, you know, work together and share the information. But I do, st do still think, you know, that we need to, you know, better inform and make the intelligence community uh, aware of the information needs and requirements of a trooper uh, out on patrol and why something, you know, that occurred over in Afghanistan or Pakistan regarding an IED, how that could help them uh, do their better job at not only a tactical level but also uh, at a strategic level. Um, I believe fully, you know, within the fusion centers, that national network of fusion centers, uh, that is plan A. That's something that we've been building. Uh, there is no plan B and nor should there be a plan B uh, because I believe, you know, that's the solution uh, given the proper support and I believe that, that we're, we're doing that. And they also work very closely, they, the fusion centers, uh, with the Joint Terrorism Task Forces uh, in their role to investigate and pursue the individuals operating with the co within the country. So in conclusion, you know, I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Uh, a lot has occurred. Uh, we have a lot more to do, um, and I look forward uh, to all of your questions. Thank you very much, Ozzy. Thank you. Well, well, thank you all for those remarks. Again, any of you could, could serve as a keynote in your own. I love this panel. Um, I really do. This is an amazing panel here, uh, but, you know, between um, – uh, uh, Gill and Bart at the end, 70 years of law enforcement experience, 24 as state trooper level, uh, nine uh, as a chief of police from a major U.S. city, uh, cured from State Department, you know, 
knew it. State Department really wasn't part of the public dialogue and information sharing until 9, you know, 12, 25. And all of a sudden it was a failure of State Department consular affairs. I had no idea the number, the amount of data that they were processing on a, data, on a daily basis, on a monthly basis. And of course, you know, Russ, having shown up at NCTC in spring of 2005, your comments are, are, are very appropriate. And we cannot forget how much progress we have made. I know where we were in 2005. I hear where we are now. And a lot of that was because of, because of Russ and the team out there and their initiatives. And, and we have made progress. And I think it's important not, not to forget how far we have come. So with that backdrop, uh, I'd like to turn over some questions from the audience. Who wants to go first? I can't believe there would be not be one question. And thank you for bailing me out. <laughs> I have a bunch of questions, but I'd rather you ask them. Hi, uh, my name is Mike German. I'm with the ACLU. Um, one of the uh, sort of it, it seems to be almost accepted that information sharing is a good no matter what. Where I think all of us would agree that it's only good if the information that's being shared is actually relevant and accurate. And uh, you know what we have seen so often with these information collection and sharing programs is that the information isn't. Uh, Haida, for instance, was the recipient of information from a Maryland State Police spying scandal where 53 political activists with no connection to terrorism were put into the Haida database uh, and labeled as terrorists. Uh, we have a number of fusion center reports that target political groups uh, in their intelligence analysis. Uh, and most recently, we have the case in Pennsylvania where a private company hired by a state homeland security entity funded by the Department of Homeland Security uh, was involved in inappropriate spying on political protesters. So my question is, who is it within this information sharing network that has the responsibility to make sure that the information collected is collected appropriately, that it's being analyzed correctly, and that it's being distributed only to people who deserve to and, and need to have it and have a legitimate right to have it. Starting off with an easy question. Who wants to go? Bart, you want to go first and then Gil? Thanks, Mike, for that question. Um, for, first and foremost, um, you know, I, I really believe that those um, are the exception, uh, not the rule. Um, having spent uh, 32 years in law enforcement, um, you're very much trained about a reasonable suspicion, you know, probable cause, that I just can't walk up to an individual and start asking questions. I need to have reasonable suspicion that criminal activity, you know, could be afoot. Um, and if I don't have that, you know, level of uh, intervention, I, uh, I record it you know, and document it and forward it in where it gets, you know, accountable by a supervisor and then finds its way uh, into the system. So those checks and balances, you know, are there. Um, as it relates to, you know, who's a lead, um, I would say that uh, DHS, you know, has a lead as a result of the directive um, of the, uh, uh, the White House. But having said that, um, we're doing it in, in partnership with the PM's office, the FBI. Uh, Alex Joel is here from the ODNI. And I'm very, you know, uh, happy to say that, you know, working with Tom O'Reilly with the SAR, that finally, you know, all those activities, you know, are being trained to, accountable to, documented to. So as it gets into the shared space, that it's more likely to be accurate to prevent what you, you know, described has occurred. Um, and additionally, uh, the fusion center policies. And Shermender mentioned that too. We're well on our way. In fact, I think we just cracked a third. Um, so it's greatly accelerated to have that privacy policies in place, the training, the accountability, the privacy, you know, officers in place. So although, you know, there is a risk, and I hope it's a very small risk, we're defaulting on, on, on the side, you know, that, hey, we have the systems in place and we're working towards, you know, mitigating, you know, any, um, you know, activity, um, innocent, you know, or nefarious, which could be accountable to as we move forward. The question really is, it's a great question, and it's important. Um, a couple things that I think are important about HIDAs. One is that they're locally controlled. If you look at uh, the, the most recent Gallup poll on who uh, is trusted in, this, uh, in, in the country by the American public, it's the United States military, it's locally owned small business, and it is local law enforcement. The uh, HIDAs are, uh, are locally managed, locally run. In fact, when I was in Seattle, I got to sit on that, uh, on that HIDA board. And so I don't think that there's any better accountability than at that level than, uh, than perhaps when you're inside the beltway, the, the uh, accountability issue is, 
is, uh, is a bit more diffused. The other part is I think that uh, anyone who spent this length of time in law enforcement knows, and I think we've seen a lot of success, particularly in the last decade, on crime in this country, even though a lot of people thought, well, the economy isn't doing so well, therefore crime is going to go up. Crime, not in every city, not every year, but crime has continued to decrease. Uh, I'd love to tell you it's because of great police chiefs, but that's pro <laughs> probably a bit self-serving. Uh, it's actually because of, uh, I, I think, of the trust in the information and the work that has been done to gain the trust of the people who give you the information uh, and uh, who are willing to come forward, uh, people from all walks of life and all languages and all, uh, uh, all ethnic and, uh, and racial backgrounds. I think it's improved. So to damage that trust, uh, uh, is incredibly hurtful in many ways. So I think that uh, we, we have made mistakes. I think we need to be accountable for those mistakes. But I think uh, I think we've made a lot of improvements, and uh, and I welcome the partnership with the ACLU in Seattle. And maybe just one final point on the issue of who is responsible. I, frankly, all of us are. Uh, in, in my case, uh, at NCTC, I got responsibility for terrorist identities work and a support to watch listing and large-scale data aggregation. And Alex Joel is a constant partner with us to ensure that what we're doing is correct, that, that any of the data sets that we bring in from any department and agency, uh, we spend extensive amounts of time working with the other department and agency, civil rights, civil liberties uh, individuals, uh, uh, Alex, our attorneys, and so I think it's fair to say that everyone takes this exceptionally uh, importantly. And uh, do things occasionally go wrong? Absolutely. But as a general proposition, I think we're all, all responsible. Kirit, did you want to add anything? That's an important question. Uh, yeah, I mean, we take this very seriously as far as the privacy information is concerned. Obviously, we deal with a lot of information from the Americans, 90 million Americans own passports today. Uh, as I said earlier in my opening remarks, that uh, if you remember two years ago, there was that breach from within about the presidential candidates. Today, we do have very stringent uh, checks and balances in place to avoid that. Uh, very role-based, need to know, and we track your footprints everywhere you've been right to the last keystroke. Uh, so if something does go and somebody does compromise, there is penalties to be paid. So protecting the privacy, as I said, we have a lots of data. And now it's become an even bigger issue for us because a non-immigrant or an immigrant coming in somewhere gets naturalized along the way and becomes a US citizen, okay, could very well go on us and say, if the previous visa data was compromised. Now he's an, he or she is an American. So we take that very seriously. Also, the outside users that we say are non-state department, they're all role-based. And we control that to the nth degree. Do things go wrong? Yes. I mean, we have an issue right now that came up. I'll be very frank about it, is the E-Verify program. Right? The employers are supposed to online check against that data. They go into our data. Somebody had somehow gotten into some data that just shouldn't have, but we caught them before it went out, before it, we were able to apprehend them and stop them from doing that. So we do take the privacy very seriously, and we ought to. All of us want to be protected ourselves, right? So. Great, thank you for that. And the next question, all, all the way in the back, the gentleman along the wall, please. Uh, sorry, go ahead and get the microphone and uh, yes. your name and where you're from. Yes, my name is James Marino. I'm president of WWN Software. Uh, just out of curiosity, you said E-Verify. They, they got into that information. Wasn't that information encrypted? Right, but it was encrypted. Okay. Okay, the reason I say this is that and I'm going to plug our company a little bit here. Uh, no we, statements, only questions. <laughs> well, it's a question at the end. What we do is we take, we take encrypted data, and this is used for, for investigations. And we do not need to decrypt the information for investigators to, to find relevant data. And we, it actually matches data shares and data matches information. 
We've taken this to DHS. And it's a curiosity that you gentlemen don't know about this. I don't understand where the information goes. Because if you could use this information every day in your world, I think it would be very useful. Again, it's WWN software. And let me, let me just say, as a question, if you had that kind of tool, and by the way, that tool gives you a report, and that report kicks out the person that actually accessed the investigation in the encrypted format. So it gives you all the information as a managerial point of view, gives you that information. Why wouldn't you want to use that? I, I think that's that, the question. Well, I, I don't think there's not a panelist up here that wouldn't yeah, I mean, who want the data. <laughs> I, I, I appreciate where the point's coming from. I don't think that, uh, that they but, would turn away any useful right. tool. Right. Well, but my question is, why, should, why don't they know it? Somebody should be telling these gentlemen about technology that exists that they could be using. That it would help them, I think, greatly. But we do. We play in the private-public partnerships to the nth degree. How come you're not using my software? Okay, somebody help me out here and ask a question. <laughs> All right, the, the orange tie. Thank you, sir. Give that guy an extra Danish. Hi, it's Ken Delanian with the LA Times. Uh, Russ, um, we talked about this the other day, but you mentioned the legal impediments to information sharing. Um, is there any thought that some of these laws need to be changed or tweaked the way that FOIA provision was, was placed in the Intelligence Authorization Bill? I mean, is there anything that needs to be done on FISA or the Privacy Act that would make your life and your, your mission easier? Hey, Ken. Uh, there, there are any number of initiatives uh, to look at legal impediments. Uh, the NCTC has restrictions now on what uh, FISA information we can get, and we're approaching the court with um, uh, our ability to get that kind of information. So as, as the impediments are recognized uh, and there's uh, an established need to have a particular kind of information, uh, then we work it through the system. Uh, I would associate myself with whoever asked the question in the first panel, or Tishamandra, has there been a, a, a A to Z accounting of all of the different legal limitations on data? I doubt it. Uh, uh, we tend to focus on the data set that we believe would be of most assistance to the analysts, and then we go through the range of legal and policy and technical and security and privacy issues that impede our ability to get that data, and then we work through them. If I may, I think I mentioned to you earlier, we are not a designated law enforcement. We have a lot of difficulty as a result because it's a legal impediment to us in terms of that. Like I said, we are working with the Hill to hopefully change that. Great. Uh, next question. Yes, ma'am, behind the camera there, blonde hair. Ashley Chalinor, Migration Policy Institute. Uh, my question is primarily for Mr. Amin. Uh, I'm kind of wondering about the relationship between um, information sharing and creating greater uh, efficiencies in, in the system, um, specifically when it comes to um, uh, processing of visas. Um, you know, obviously, we want to create a more efficient system for law enforcement, but what about the consumers of the, ser the services that the government is providing? Um, specifically um, those seeking to enter the U.S. and having to go through greater security clearances that may take months, if not longer. And I'm wondering what the potential is for creating an information system, uh, sorry, information sharing system um, that makes it easier to differentiate between the troublemakers and those who would like to enter the U.S. under more honest pretenses. Thank you. Excellent question. We have embarked on several fronts to address that issue. It's an economic reason. We get beat up by Mr. Marriott, who shows up in the Assistant Secretary's office every two, three months from the hospitality and the tourism industry, okay? It's about, and we have done studies, an average Chinese in the United States spends about $300 plus at the duty-free shops, okay? And an average of $7,000 per a Chinese visitor into the United States. Okay, Brazil right now is soaring, and, and, and it's amazing that we were working with Disney. Most of the Brazilians, the growing middle class, wants to visit Disney World. Okay, what have we done? Today, all our non-immigrant visas applications are online. 
you can apply from anywhere in the world on a web-based system, okay? For a number of reasons now. It's easier for the people who apply, but bigger than that, you are right. If I look at China, which is soaring on us about 27% increase over last year, our physical facilities, the embassies and consulates, have so much capacity, okay? So what are we doing? By going online is not the reduction of the paper. It is the automatic pre-screening we can do so that the officers can fa faster process those people. That comes back to the same information, that same statement I made earlier. We are as good as in the first line of defense of the information we have to clear those people who are the trusted travelers and don't mean any harm to us. The more information we have, the faster we can online clear them in the system so that our officers who are processing 15, 1,600 people a day have more information to process them faster and better and with secure information. So we are doing a lots of things right now. We have gone totally online, okay? I don't know if you have read several years ago People used to be just line up and camp out around our embassy walls overnight. Those days are gone. You sit at your home on web-based and you make your application. You make an appointment and you show up strictly for your appointment and we process you. So with secure and other information that if we have available, we can process them and faster. That's exactly what we are working towards because there is no way the brick and mortar is gonna cut it in the four big ones we call India, China, Brazil, and Mexico, which are soaring big time on us. And you're right, it's a global economy now as well. It's not just about people wanting to come here for whatever reasons, but they are coming here and we have to in terms of the economics as well. Thank you for that question. Next, yes sir, in front. More caffeine for the interns, pick it up. Uh, Peter Sharfman, MITRE Corporation. Uh, as I understood it, Mr. Travers was suggesting that uh, if we distinguished among different roles that intelligence analysts may have, uh, some roles call for uh, more information than other roles or different kinds of information than other roles. And this might help solve the problem that there is some information that really shouldn't be made available to everybody, but nevertheless has to get to somebody. Uh, I'd really appreciate hearing from Bart Johnson how he thinks that concept might work in actual fusion centers. Thanks, Peter. Um, I, you know, coming from a state and local background, um, oftentimes, you know, the analysts are uh, overwhelmed with information, uh, information overload, uh, let alone the number of systems out there, whether it's uh, HISN, LEO, RIS, and every other thing that you need a password for. Um, I, I agree wholeheartedly with role-based uh, access uh, to information. Um, I don't know if we're, we're there yet. I know we're working, you know, towards that. Um, but I would say that, that an analyst would need information, you know, passed, you know, from DHS or FBI or whomever uh, that is relevant to their area of responsibility that will impact on them. So to be able to receive the information, look at the information, and really overlay it uh, against, you know, what that information is telling you as it relates to a risk associated with a CIKR or a potential threat that may be resident within your area of responsibility, and then really contextualizing it and making sure that it resonates with your community for which you're serving, law enforcement, private sector, or whomever, to really feed that cycle for the suspicious activity so you have a better informed law enforcement officer to respond to that and, and enter it and get it back up into the system to compare it. Um, I think we have a ways to go, um, but working, you know, with our partners here, many of whom are in the room, um, I think we recognize, you know, what the issues are and we really need to focus on it and try to solve that uh, aspect of it. So thanks, Peter. If I could add just a, a couple of comments. Uh, for instance, if, if before 9-11, the, the federal government had issued reports on jihadist interest in airplanes. And that could have been put out at a number of levels of classification. And if such information had made it to Phoenix or Minneapolis, then the, end of the FBI and local law enforcement would have had some context for a dot that they uncovered. 
and the, the sort of current analog would be things like uh, putting out a report from, from FBI or DHS or, or my own uh, ITAG-G that there are individuals interested in hydrogen peroxide that can then be used by local law enforcement and the eyes and ears who are out there to say, hey, we saw something like this. That seems to me to be a far better answer than just flooding the system with information and overwhelming people. Great. Suzanne, do you have a question in the back? <clears throat> we, you talked about the value, obviously, of the state and local folks as tactical collectors um, and the importance of, of making sure that analysts at that level get what they need. Um, I, I'm also concerned about governance at that level. You talked about one of the values of state and local uh, involvement is that local uh, accountability also. But if you're operating in a context in which only a couple of folks, a couple of police officers, for example, or a couple of folks from the sheriff's office have clearances, and are either at the JTTF or the Fusion Center, um, how does that uh, affect the ability of the mayor, the chief of police, the sheriff, the city council to conduct that important oversight and ensure accountability um, at that local level that we're so dependent upon? And, and does this, perhaps this notion of role-based um, access to information, which we apply to governors, for example, as opposed to giving clearances to everybody, um, is, is, the, is that a potential solution, and, and, and how did that work out in Seattle? I think the thing that was most helpful um, uh, was that, uh, for instance, the link system has a series of checks and balances uh, as to who can access that system and when it's been accessed. And actually, there are uh, uh, several disciplinary cases within that uh, Seattle region for inappropriate uh, access or inappropriate use of, of information. Uh, we had lived with an intelligence auditor, an outside independently appointed individual who would review all of the intelligence gathering within the, within the Seattle Police Department. Right after 9-11, we looked very uh, carefully at whether we should actually move forward in an attempt to, uh, to change that. And uh, after some pretty careful analysis, we came to the realization that we could both do our job in protecting the people in Seattle and also protect uh, uh, privacy and civil liberties with the law as it existed. And this was a law, by the way, written uh, an ordinance written before uh, 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 the internet, which in Seattle is kind of uh, pretty interesting. I, I think it's kind of a wired area. The rumor. Uh, uh, I think the other part is, though, that uh, that you have to, and I think there's something like well over 300,000 clearances that have now been granted. The federal government has moved much more swiftly to grant clearances to people that need them because uh, whether it was the mayor in Seattle or myself, you actually needed those clearances not only for information that you needed for the city, but you needed it so that you could instill and install uh, the systems uh, for the checks and balances. And I think it worked pretty well. And, and also as it relates to the uh, fusion centers, um, if you haven't looked at the uh, baseline capabilities, uh, um, I, I encourage you to do that. Because resident within the baseline capabilities, uh, it speaks to that as it relates to you know the governance, um, the process, uh, the memorandums of under understanding, uh, expectations you know of the fusion center uh, from DHS. What am I going to support? You know what the FBI is going to support and what to expect. And you look also at the uh, uh, 2010 uh, grant guidance, uh, where for the first time you know information sharing is being highlighted as a priority, and coupled with that. Um, is the uh, mandate that within six months of the execution of that, you know, grant award, that fusion center will have to have a privacy policy in place, and if not, you could only use that grant guidance to build that privacy policy. And anything this day forward as it relates to mitigating the critical operational capabilities will be lined up against, you know, supporting through gap mitigation and sust sustainment to fill those things like privacy and security and MOUs and governance to make sure that the governor, the HSA, and the chiefs and the troopers have a full view of that. Um, so we're here. We've come a long way, um, but we need to get here, and we have a path and a plan to do exactly that. Right, the gentleman right here in the Brian Weir with Digital Sandbox. So th there's a lot of experience uh, up here on the panel. So I, I just wanted to kind of ask you, where do you see all this going? If, if we took uh, the implementation of information sharing 
all the way to its ultimate extension, and that means having access at the right time, the right way, to all of the information that's available. And I'm just reading the, the Secretary's testimony uh, before Congress recently, she was talking about the increase of U.S. citizens who are uh, becoming radicalized. And you know, I think it would be so convenient if those were living uh, on a compound in Waco, but just recently this, uh, this guy in Ottawa was uh, you know, on Canadian Idol, you know, so much a part of the fabric of society, not apart from the fabric of society. So how do you see, you know, wh where do you see all this going over the next five years, this, uh, both the threat and the, the role of information sharing, the limitations of information sharing? If we had all that information, how are we going to find these guys that aren't so separate from what we're looking at? That's a great question to end on. And we'll, can we take an answer from each of the panelists? Anybody want to go first? Well, Bart, we'll, we'll end with you since it's a homeland issue. Russ, we'll start with you. <laughs> you can say I don't want to answer too, Russ. <laughs> uh, I frankly don't know where it's going to end. Where I, where I hope we get started is on a far more sophisticated debate about domestic intelligence and privacy and so forth. I, I think we've, we've tended towards kind of bumper stickers on, on issues that are incredibly complex. Uh, I, I give all the credit in the world to the Markle Foundation who, who foresaw this six years ago, I think, and, and tried to engender a debate, didn't really get traction. Uh, and to some degree that was okay. We were largely dealing with plots that were overseas, people that were radicalized overseas, uh, and most of the activity was overseas. Now, as I mentioned, with foreign and domestic divide not meaning very much anymore, and now U.S. citizens, U.S. persons being directly involved, how much of that information do you want people like me, 30 years intelligence community, to have access to? And I don't, I don't think there's any, um, there's not an obvious answer. I mean, there, there does need to be a sophisticated debate in the country that involves the Congress and the executive branch and the body politic, and I, I think we're not there yet. Uh, I would put it two ways. Do we have enough information or is information leading to information fatigue, if you will, right? It goes both ways. Too much information is not going to give you, which we, in our terms, call information fatigue, right? So you have to find that balance somewhere. And also protecting the privacy issue. One of the ways we do that is we go on the red light, green light issue. You can have access. We're going to tell you this is red light or a green light. If you need further information, now you have to go higher up or more clear personnel or however you do that. So you avoid that information fatigue, so to speak. Quickly you can say, okay, this is, as far as we know, it's a green light. There's not an issue here. Or it's a red light and watch out. There's something here. Pass it on to some other authorities, if you will. Just because of the sheer numbers that we deal with, how do you go about doing that? and also protect the privacy and others. So where does this lead to is, you know, sometimes too much information might not be doing you any good, okay? So focusing on the right information and how you go about balancing that. So here's where I think, think two things will, will occur. One is reconciling in my mind from, a, from this career in law enforcement. We had some pretty horrible crimes and uh, an attack on the Jewish Federation and uh, uh, just awful crimes, uh, a mass murder of young people after, after a party. And so oftentimes as a police chief, I'd go to these community meetings. People in those community meetings didn't blame me for the attack on the Jewish Federation. They didn't blame me for a person taking a weapon and, and killing a num number of people. They wanted to know what we did, what, how we responded, what we were going to do to move forward and protect the community. And here on the terrorism issue, we seem to have led this country to a belief that we are going to, government, is going to prevent all bad things from happening. And it's, it's not going to happen. It didn't happen in the, in the UK over 30 years of, uh, of the terrorist issue. Uh, I think that uh, one theme that has been central is that we've all talked about the complexity of the problem, the difficulty of the problem, and the fact that a bumper sticker like connect the dots 
doesn't work. Connect the dots should probably be cast aside along with war on drugs and frankly secure the border because I'm not sure exactly what it means and how it works. And I actually truly believe that the American public is ready to understand that you have really smart, dedicated, honest people working very hard every single day, oftentimes many hours, to try and protect them. But you know what? It is a big country with a lot of borders and there are people that want to hurt us and uh, and frankly try as we might uh, uh, some bad things are going to happen in the future Brian uh, just you know give you a nuts and bolts answer uh, to that one uh, I, I've been doing this since September 11th of 2001 you know as a New York State trooper and I've seen the maturations the ebbs and flows you know and supported fully the D DHS enterprise and the people that preceded me and what has evolved you know is a much better uh, situation so to be a New York State trooper, what you need to know um, is, number one, people who are operating in your area of responsibility that you need to be concerned about and support the Bureau in those investigations. You need the tools and the training and the situational awareness about uh, tactics, techniques, and procedures to identify uh, the unknowns that may be operating uh, within your area of responsibility, like Faisal Shahzad, like Najibul Azazi, if he wasn't already uh, detected, you know, by uh, the FBI. And then lastly, um, you know, working um, with intelligence-led policing, you know, community-orientated policing, everything that law enforcement has been doing for centuries as it relates to working the community, uh, knowing the community, and understanding and recognizing a person that may be going down the wrong road and encouraging that person through civic, church, or school, or sports, or family to get on the proper road. And that's what the Secretary spoke about through homeland violent extremism by trying to identify the bad guys who are probably already bad, and also countering violent extremism about the good people who may be going down the wrong road and making sure they stay that way. But suffice to say, the relationship, you know, with the NCTC and the relevant information within the intelligence community and how do you sift through it all and get that information into that, you know, young trooper, you know, out on the road, that's the thing that we need to accomplish. And I think we're well on our way uh, in that construct. So thank you. Great. Well, let's give this uh, wonderful panel a warm round of applause. Thank you very much. We're going to move to our off-the-record portion reconvened at about 11.05, so again, thank you.